Uh, greetings again, class, from my basement. Um, before we get into the discussion on Carnap and Gettier, I first wanted to read part of a kid's book because then that's going to be your journal entry and your last journal entry. Journal entry for this week and then journals will be due next Monday. Frederick. <clears throat> All along the meadow where the cows grazed and the horses ran, there was an old stone wall. <clears throat> In that wall, not far from the barn and the granary, a chatty family of field mice had their home. But the farmers had moved away, the barn was abandoned, and the granary stood empty. And since winter was not far off, the little mice began to gather corn and nuts and wheat and straw. They all worked day and night, all except Frederick. Frederick, why don't you work, they asked. I do work, said Frederick. I gather sun rays for the cold, dark winter days. And when they saw Frederick sitting there, staring at the meadow, they asked, And now, Frederick? I gather colors, answered Frederick simply, for winter is gray. And once, Frederick seemed half asleep. Are you dreaming, Frederick? They asked reproachfully. But Frederick said, oh no, I'm gathering words, for the winter days are long and many, and we'll run out of things to say. The winter days came, and when the first snow fell, the five little field mice took to their hideout in the stones. I'm not going to finish the book. <clears throat> Maybe I'll finish it for the video for next week. Um, but I want to know, is Frederick working? And then an extension of that, then what is work anyway? How do you define work? So there's the journal for this week. Now, on to Rudolf Carnap. So this is the excerpt that starts on page 121, the end of metaphysics. And so remember that David Hume limited metaphysics almost to the point of elimination. And Carnap wants to take it that next step. Rudy Carnap is in the analytic tradition so we did Hegel last time, that's the continental tradition, very holistic, right? It's very much about self-awareness and um, consciousness and so on and so forth. Analytic philosophy is much more about, let's figure out what we mean when we say things. Let's make sure that we're precise in our language. Let's have our philosophy look much more like logic itself. And so even this particular excerpt, if you read it, you'll see it's laid out very logically, right? There's he does this, and then this, and then this, and then this. It makes sense where he's going next. In contrast to someone like Heidegger, right? And Heidegger and Carnap are contemporaries, but doing completely different things, focusing on completely different aspects of philosophy. They disagree on what philosophy itself is. Heidegger thinks it's about the question of the meaning of being. Carnap thinks, forget about that metaphysics stuff, forget that ontology stuff. What philosophy is, it's logic. It's precision of language. What do you mean when you say that the Continentals take their cue from someone like Plato, who's doing this transcendent tale of the soul? The analytics want to take a step back and talk about Socrates. Socrates was the one who was in the marketplace with the young nobleman asking, what do you mean when you say justice? What, what is beauty anyway? Truth, tell me more about that. Right? Let's be precise so that we can actually have a conversation because to far too frequently what happens is I have my idea of what a word or set of words means. You have your idea of what a word or set of words might mean. And they're going to be completely different, but we're using the same words so we act like we're talking with one another when really we're talking past one another. So that's part of Carnap's concern here. And Carnap is from the school called the Logical Positivists. Um, these were primarily British folks, a couple of Europeans too who hung out in Vienna together. In the, so they were also called the Vienna Circle. And so he's gonna start by giving us kind of a history of other attempts to eliminate metaphysics and why they fell short. So remember for Hume, 
metaphysics is one of the illegitimate classes of human inquiry. It's neither a relation of ideas, nor is it a matter of fact. Therefore, it's something else, therefore should be cast to the flames. Curiosity, maybe, but that's about it. So here, Carnap. There have been many opponents to metaphysics, from the Greek skeptics to the empiricists of the 19th century. There he's talking about Hume and so forth. Criticisms of very diverse kinds have been set forth. Many have declared that the doctrine of metaphysics is false, since it contradicts our empirical knowledge. Okay? So some have claimed metaphysics itself false. There is no such thing as metaphysics. All we have is physics. And this is sort of where Aristotle was leaning. right? Aristotle, by stopping at the chasm for the divided line, senses and senses plus mind, let's stop there is really equating things like appearance to reality. They're one and the same thing. Heraclitus, what we see is change. What the world actually is, is change. Right? There's no stability underlying it. Um, and so anything metaphysical, anything beyond what we actually see and experience and hear and all of those sensory input data things, anything beyond that then must be false. What's true is what we can see. Seeing is believing. Forget about the believing part. Seeing is knowing. These are one and the same. So that's been one attempt to claim that they're just false. Another attempt. Others have believed it to be uncertain on the ground that its problems transcend the limits of human knowledge. That's Hume. Right? It's an illegitimate class of human inquiry. The legitimate classes actually do something for us. The relations of ideas, mathematics, definitions, that's useful. Science is useful. It gives us new information. Metaphysics, subject-object stuff, who needs it? It's garbage. Many anti-metaphysicians have declared that their occupation with metaphysical questions is sterile. It's pointless. It's useless. Why bother with questions of metaphysics? Why does any of it matter? What matters is science. And so he's writing this in the 1920s, just like Heidegger was, right? Heidegger is concerned that we've all become too scientific, that we've become objects rather than subjects. We need to remember the point of science is to point us back to the answer to the question of the meaning of being. Carnap's sort of taking the opposite direction. They both think that they're being more practical. Both Carnap and Heidegger think that they're doing more practical philosophy by doing what they're doing. Heidegger thinks it's more tied to self and therefore more practical, more concrete, less abstract. Carnap, we'll see, by tying it to the words that we use, by tying it to language, thinks it's being much more practical, much more concrete. What do we actually say and what do we mean when we say that? And so these metaphysical questions then are sterile. There's no point in asking them. Whether or not these questions can be answered is at any rate unnecessary to worry about them. Let us devote ourselves entirely to the practical tasks which confront active men every day of their lives. This is Carnap again, page 121. Practical. And so what he's going to do is he's going to eventually claim that all of the words of metaphysics are literally meaningless, that they do not have definition, they do not have meaning. And so whenever a metaphysician utters these words, regardless of the rest of the context, they're not really saying anything. That's why it's pointless, that's why it's sterile, that's why it's not really philosophy. And Carnap and Heidegger are also both writing in the 1920s when progress is being made in math in science. I mean, this is after World War I. This is after that great intellectual boom that occurred around World War I, the early 1900s, the 19-teens. We're now into the 20s. And so thinkers are like, oh man, how can we make even more progress and more progress and more progress? Again, progress is still inevitable in the 1920s. It's not until at least the 1960s, maybe the 1970s, where the idea that progress was the case and was going to continue forever was called into question. So Carnap goes on then. And again, what's nice about Carnap, in contrast to Hegel and Heidegger, is he defines stuff. 
Heidegger and Hegel, remember, are just kind of giving eh, generalities. Eh, it's probably kind of like this, sort of. They just throw some stuff out there, kind of loosely tie it together. Carnap is walking very, very slowly, very definitionally. He defines this, he moves on, defines this, he moves on and defines this. Remember, when we looked at Kant, there was a place for all of that. That Kant was very definitional, 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 but he was also very much focused on the subject, right? Those concepts of the understanding, the structures of the mind, which is why Kant is studied by both analytics and continentals. Carnap, the continentals don't care. What he's doing is not really philosophy. For the analytics, what Hegel and Heidegger are doing, not really philosophy. And Carnap has something very interesting to say about continental, continental thinkers and metaphysicians at the very end, which is fantastic. It may not be right, but it's still fantastic. <clears throat> so he talks about the development of modern logic here at the top of page 122. Right? And so that's what we're, that's the, the crux, that's the, that's the foundation stone for all of what philosophy is and should be for someone like Rudy Carnap. And he has something very, very slick here on 122 at the bottom of that first paragraph. If you remember all the way back to like day two of class, and I was talking about the sub-disciplines of philosophy, and I said that one of the major divisions, not the analytic continental divide necessarily, though it sort of gets played out that way, is between value fields and other things. So when we had value fields, which included ethics and aesthetics, politics, economics, things of that nature, where there are things that are better and there are things that are worse. There, it's not true false claims, right? The true false claims were on the side of over here, of things like metaphysics, and epistemology, right? Over here, metaphysics and epistemology merely descriptive. Here's the way that it is. Truly, here's the way that it is. Or falsely, here's the way that it is. It either does correspond to reality or it doesn't, right? There's nothing we can do about it. We can't change the state of reality. Either it's stable or it's in flux. Someone's right, someone's wrong. Someone's correct, someone's incorrect. These are sort of like relations of ideas over here to go back to Hume. But over here, this stuff's about the world, like Hume's matters of fact, and therefore aren't true or false. Rather, gee, this work of art is prettier, more beautiful, less beautiful, as compared and contrasted with something else. There's a compare and contrast here that doesn't take place over here. This isn't true and false. There's not one true system of economics and all the rest are false, there can be one that's better and the rest are worse. That's placing value. So now here's the slick thing that Carnap does that's easy to miss, and this isn't in translation. Carnap wrote in English. Right? So we're not missing anything in translation here. This is so slick, it's so brilliant, so good. <clears throat> and so this is, again, the last Actually, the last two sentences of the first paragraph on page 122. In the domain of metaphysics, including all philosophy of value and normative theory, logical analysis yields the negative result that the alleged statements in this domain are entirely meaningless. And we'll talk about what that means here in a second. But notice what he's done is he's said metaphysics is a value field. He's moved metaphysics to over here, leaving only epistemology in this other side. Metaphysics, then, if it's a value field, is not true or false, but merely better or worse. And you'll say later on that really all metaphysics is is a reflection of the personal beliefs that the metaphysician has. They're not really stating anything about reality. They're merely stating things about themselves, hmm. or what they would wish to be the case, rather than actually what is the case. 
So metaphysics then is not true false, it's not epistemology. Metaphysics is more like ethics, aesthetics, politics, economics. He doesn't make a claim for this. He doesn't give an argument on behalf of this. He just went in one sentence, well, yeah, metaphysics, you know, like all the other value fields, and then moves on. It's so fantastic because nobody calls him out on it. Very slick. <clears throat> And so then back to that sentence again, metaphysics, including all philosophy of value and normative theory, normative, not descriptive, giving prescription rather than merely description. Logical analysis then, remember this is built on logic, logical analysis yields the negative result that the alleged statements in this domain, metaphysics, are entirely meaningless. Hmm. Bear with a radical elimination of metaphysics is attained. That's how we eliminate metaphysics. From Carnap's perspective, the way you eliminate metaphysics is to indicate and to prove that the words that they use mean nothing. They are devoid of meaning. If I start speaking things like that's devoid of meaning. That doesn't mean anything to you. Those aren't real words. There's no concepts behind those. That's just me making stuff up. Welcome to the world of metaphysics, says Rudy Carnap. Hegel's just making stuff up. Heidegger's just making stuff up. That's what metaphysics is. Hey, let's make some stuff up and try to convince people it's true. Let's cloak it in philosophy when really it's not. It's really something else. And so then if he's telling us that these claims then are meaningless, then what's he got to do next? Explain what do you mean by meaningless? I'm so glad you asked. That's the next paragraph. In saying that the so-called statements of metaphysics are meaningless, and remember, if the metaphysical words themselves are meaningless, then the statements they appear in are also meaningless. They're not real statements. They're so-called statements. The language here is so precise and so nice. In saying that the so-called statements of metaphysics are meaningless, we intend this word in its strictest sense. And here he's laying the groundwork for the rest of the essay. He's going to mean everything in its strictest sense. A definition. Definitive. One. In its strictest sense. In a loose sense, right? In not the way that I mean meaningless. The way other people sometimes misuse this word. In a loose sense of the word. A statement or a question is at times called meaningless. It's not meaningless. It's called meaningless if it's entirely sterile to assert or ask it. Right? One of the ways that previous philosophers attempted to eliminate metaphysics by claiming that all of its claims are sterile. Who cares? It doesn't impact me. It's meaningless. Uh -uh -uh -uh. Meaningless is different than fruitful or sterile. We might, that one of these loose ways, this sterile meaning of meaninglessness, we might say this, for instance, about the question, what's the average weight of those inhabitants of Vienna whose telephone number ends in three? If someone were to ask you that question, you would say, who cares? That's stupid. It doesn't matter. It's meaningless. Whoa, hold on a second. Carnap would agree with you on the first three, but disagree. He's like, no, no, no. It's not meaningless. It is stupid. It's sterile to ask. Nobody cares. <coughs> that does not make it meaningless. Some people out there, others, non-trained philosophers, non-analytics, people who aren't as careful and precise in using their words, may say meaningless when they when when it's something like this, a statement that's obviously false. Like in 1910, Vienna had six inhabitants. That's obviously false. That's stupid to make that claim. Does not make that claim meaningless. Or, perhaps about a statement which is not just empirically, but logically false. Empirical falsehood would be like Hume's matters of facts. Logical falsehood would be like his relations of ideas logically false, a contradictory statement, such as 
persons A and B are each a year older than the other. Such sentences, all of these ones we've just talked about, that some people would claim are meaningless. Those some people are incorrect. These statements are not meaningless. They're sterile. Who cares? Or they're obviously false, but they have meaning. They have significance. The words in the statements, all, all of us know what they mean. There's no disagreement. 1910, what do you mean by 1910? Vienna, what are you talking about? Everyone completely understands exactly what we're talking about. That's how they know it's stupid and sterile and who cares? Such sentences then are really meaningful, although they are pointless or false. For it is only meaningful sentences that are even divisible into fruitful and sterile, true and false. And remember, the claims of metaphysics are not going to be true and false, they're a value field. Hmm. In the strict sense, a sequence of words is meaningless if it does not, within a specified language, constitute a statement. It may happen that such a sequence of words looks like a statement at first glance. In that case, we will call it a pseudo-statement. It's somewhat statement-like, but not actually a statement. Our thesis now is that logical analysis reveals the alleged statements of metaphysics to be but pseudo-statements. So then we've got to figure out, okay, if you're telling me these things are meaningless, then how do we determine whether something has meaning? I'm so glad you asked because that's the next thing Rudolf Carnap's going to talk about. See how this follows logically, right? Your very next thing, like, whoa, okay, if this is meaningless, then what's meaningful? Ta-da, that's what's next, bottom of page 122. What now, then, is the meaning of a word? What stipulations concerning a word must be made in order for it to be significant? Well, firstly, the syntax of the word must be fixed, i.e., the mode of its occurrence in the simplest sentence form in which it is capable of occurring. We call this sentence form the elementary sentence. The elementary sentence for, form for the word stone, for example, is X is a stone. Pretty simple. In sentences of this form, some designation from the category of things occupies the place of X. For example, this diamond, this apple, this stone. That's elementary sentences. That's the simplest syntax that a word can appear in. This is that thing. This harkens back to Aristotle. Remember, he was talking about this is, this table, this table, this table, this table. It's all of these particular tables then that's the concept building stuff that we talked about. Pardon me. I don't have the, the thing. I'm just end of term cold. This happens to me every semester because I stay up too late grading and get up too early grading and all that stuff. It's just end of semester cold, I assure you. <clears throat> this apple, this diamond. And notice there's going to be a pointing to here. Just like Aristotle, right? Particular substances, particular subjects, individuals have to be point outable, point toable. This, 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 everything, right? Carnap's on board with that, and he's just saying, look, when it comes to defining things, give me a picture dictionary. Think about dictionaries that children start off with are picture dictionaries. Stone, what do you have? The picture of a stone. Every dictionary should be like that. Instead of a series of words describing the thing, just show me a picture. What the heck does running look like? What the heck does a couch look like? It's frequently how you learn another language as well. Right? You're shown a picture of something. Oh yeah, lose. Mesa or whatever it is. Secondly then, so firstly, point to the thing, that's a fill in the blank. Secondly, for an elementary sentence containing the word, an answer must be given to the following questions. Okay, now all of these questions are really the same question. All four of these are the same thing. He's just wording it differently to, again, be more precise, to be more clear. 
Firstly, what sentences is it deducible from and what sentences are deducible from it? This is that deductive pattern stuff we talked about. Right? So he's using S to stand in for this sentence that he's talking about. So let's talk about something like R's and S's. If R, then S. S, therefore R. Right? Invalid pattern. Affirming the consequent tells me nothing. But S at least fits somehow. Right? We're, we're seeing, oh, this is how S is deduced from this, premise one, and how from it you can deduce the conclusion. It fits into logic. That's one of the ways that you define something. That's one of the ways something has significance and meaning. What is it deduced from and what can you deduce from it? How does it fit into a logical pattern? Secondly, which again is the same thought, the same concept, just worded differently. Under what conditions is S supposed to be true? And under what conditions is it false? What's the criteria here for determining whether this is true or false? Thirdly, how is it to be verified? How do you justify it? How do you justify what? Determining whether it's true or false. So that the fact that it fits into a pattern means something. So what then is the meaning of S? That's how you determine meaning. How does it fit into logic? How do you determine whether it's true or false? How do you verify it? How do you justify it? These are all the same thing. All the same thing. Because remember, for the empiricist, for the logical positivist, for the 20th century and 21st century analytic, the way, the justification that counts is logic itself. More so even than something like the senses or something. Logic is universal, it's true all the time, everywhere, regardless of what you, what you think about it, regardless of how you experience it. this notion of deducibility. Every word of the language is reduced to other words and finally to the words which occur in the observation sentences, protocol sentences, elementary sentences. Every word is reduced to other words. Those other words should eventually be able to be point outable. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So he goes on then. And this is probably a thing Carnap's most well known for is this notion of Tevi. No, no E. Tevi. So let's say that I take this tablet computer thingy around my house. And I point to things that are Tevi and things that aren't Tevi. Now the whole time you're gonna be wondering, what the heck is Dr. Shropy talking about? I've never heard of this word Tevi. Can I get a definition, please? I'm giving you examples, and notice how Socratic this is. I'm giving you examples of things that are Tevi and things that are not Tevi, but I'm not defining Tevi for you. This is just like what happened with the interlocutors in the Socratic dialogues. Socrates says, hey man, what is beauty anyway? And the guy goes on to talk about, well, you know, that flower over there, and that lady over there, and that gentleman over there, and look at that building. All of these things are beautiful. Giving examples is not the same thing as defining. Defining is doing this. Defining is giving meaning to. So I walk around my house, showing you pictures of things that are tevy and things that are not tevy. And here's what's going to happen. You ask me what I mean, I say, hmm, really, I really can't answer that. I mean, I'd love to, trust me, I'd love to define Tevi for you, but here's the thing, there are no empirical signs of Teviness. This is top of page 124. In that case, if I told you no empirical signs of Teviness, in that case, here's what you would be thinking. Uh, there's no legitimacy to this word. Shroppy's finally lost it, 
He was on the verge anyway. Now this whole stay-at-home thing and the coronavirus thing, he's lost it. Let's hope his wife is buying the pads for the basement so he'll have a padded room to stay in. The man's gone. He's bonkers. He's just making stuff up. Tevi doesn't even mean anything. And I was like, no, 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 no. Hold on, class. Hold on. Tevi has meaning, I assure you. There just aren't any empirical signs of it. But that doesn't mean it's devoid of meaning. You'd wonder, but... but I'm going to say, no, no, no. There are things which are Tevi and things that are not. Only it remains for the weak, finite, intellective man an eternal secret which things are Tevi and which are not. Now again, Rudy here is being very precise in his language, being very specific with his references. Tevi here is standing in for the forms that Plato was talking about. Remember Plato, oh no, 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 there aren't really empirical signs of these forms because that's too tied to the senses. And, and I can't really define it for you because that cheapens it too. And so really it's, it's, it's our problem, it's this weak, finite mind that just can't grasp the concept of form slash Tevi. Really? Or do these forms slash Tevi really just not mean anything? Carnap doesn't go quite that far. Here's what Carnap does say. I'm, I'm trying to assure you that Tevi does mean something. From this, all that you learn is the psychological fact that I associate particular images and feelings with the word Tevi. You learn about me, you learn about Tevi. You learn, at best, about what Dr. Shrapi is talking about when he is talking about Tevi. That doesn't magically give Tevi any definition or meaning. That's just something up here in Shrapi's warped head. Tevi. Pfft, it doesn't suddenly exist out there somewhere. Oh, wow, yeah. Shroppy's using it, so I guess it must be a thing. Nah. That ain't the way language works. It's not the way language works, and if you're curious about language and how language does work, my recommended reading to you would be A Course in General Linguistics by Ferdinand de Saussure, who talks about langue and parole and how the, how the community does shape language but does not completely define language. That, that language is this outside of thing, that there is something universal about it. It's a fantastic word. It's one of my favorites. <clears throat> you just learned the psychological fact. The word does not acquire a meaning through these associations that Whack Job Shrabi has about Tevi. If there's no criterion of application for the word, then nothing is asserted by the sentences in which it occurs. They become but pseudo-statements. And here's the thing. This isn't just Plato's forms. This is every word in metaphysics. They're all devoid of meaning because there's no criterion of application. Remember when we talked about Hegel, when we talked about Heidegger, and I said, good luck defining self. That's the problem. Good luck defining awareness. That's the problem. If you can't define it, if you can't point to it, then guess what? It doesn't mean anything. All those words are like Tevi. And here's the real word. THE word that's like Tevi. Cramp talks about the bottom of page 124. Many words of metaphysics now can be shown to fulfill the above requirement and therefore be devoid of meaning. An example, oh, God. I say God to you. Let's presume that there's still a dozen students in this class. When I say it now, there's 13 different concepts of what that word means. 13 different definitions, which really means no definition. Definite. One. There can be but one definition. If we were on campus and walked around, and I point to a stone, you're all going to agree, yep, we think that's a stone too. Maybe not the one we had pictured up here, but yep, that's a stone. No disagreement here. It fits all of our definitions of stone something we can point to. There's empirical signs of it. Not the way with God. Mm. And so he goes through a brief history lesson of the concept of God and then really gets back to it at the top of page 125. To be sure, it often looks as though the word God has meaning. Even in metaphysics. And remember, some of our metaphysicians have needed a God for their system to work. Barclay specifically. 
has needed a god to be an eternal perceiver for the metaphysical system to work. The philosopher god that I talked about before. But these definitions prove upon closer inspection to be pseudo-definitions. They don't really define anything. They may point to other words, but those other words are never going to end up pointing back to anything that you can point to. It doesn't meet the criteria that he laid out just a page before about words that have meaning and have definition. Elementary sentences and so on and so forth. These lead, these metaphysical words, lead either to logically illegitimate combinations of words or to other metaphysical words. The primordial basis, the absolute, the unconditioned, the autonomous, the self-dependent, so on and so on and so on. All of them just as meaningless as all of the others. In no case to the truth conditions of its elementary sentences. The alleged statements of metaphysics which contain such words then have no sense. They assert nothing. They are mere pseudo-statements. And here this use of no sense on 125 is intentional also. One of his contemporaries in the Vienna Circle, who actually was a native-born Austrian, Ludwig Wittgenstein, I don't know why I'm writing. I know you can't read it. Wittgenstein. This is Ludwig. Fascinating fellow. So, um, the biographies about him are interesting. Classic intellectual tale, depressed as a kid, so on and so forth. Had a brother who was like the top pianist in the world at the time World War I broke out. His brother lost his left arm in World War I, fighting in the war. And so then every composer who composed music for piano, almost all of them composed a piece for one arm. Piano piece for one arm, specifically for Ludwig's brother so that he could continue to play even though he only had one arm. But anyway, so Ludwig, and he felt like he never, never measured up in his family and so on and so forth, classic tale, okay? Ludwig only wrote two pieces, two pieces of philosophy. He was a professor and so forth. His lectures and seminars were packed just like Hegel's were. And so what we have primarily are like student notes from these seminars and these lectures. Um, Anscombe took some, and there's some other folks out there too, if you really wanna get super nerdy and geeky. And these are like the blue books and the brown books and all that stuff, all uncertainty. But Wittgenstein only wrote two works, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which was his first one, which was very, very analytic, at least on the surface. And then the second piece, Philosophical Investigations, which was very continental. So Wittgenstein is also this interesting fellow who analytic philosophers read only the first work, not the second. And continentals read only the second work, not the first. And so Wittgenstein is sort of in both camps, but also sort of excluded from both camps. But anyway, Wittgenstein, in one of his writings, says that life is important nonsense. All the important stuff of life, all the fruitful stuff of life, is nonsensical. It is, to use Carnap's terms, meaningless. Ethics, aesthetics, you know, art, how to treat one another, stuff like that. That's the important stuff, but it is also meaningless. It is nonsense, because it's not definitional. Interesting. And then Carnap goes on. Bottom of 125. I should probably stop this video soon. Okay. I think I can get through Carnap though. Bottom of 125, then, he's doing a very human thing. Okay. <clears throat> Meaningful statements are divided into the following kinds. And notice the list he gives first. There are statements which are true solely by virtue of their form, true by definition. Hume's relations of ideas. They say nothing about reality. The, the formula of logic and mathematics are of this kind. All of the stuff we talked about with regards to relations of ideas with Hume fits this first category. Secondly, the negations of such statements. So things that are false by definition, which would still fit Hume's relations of ideas. Right? Bachelors are married females. Wrong, false by definition. You have incorrectly related the ideas together. You still don't need to go out into the world to ask you know it's false by definition. The third type, then, empirical statements. 
vacuum is matters of fact. Hmm. Then here's where, here's here's the capper. Here's here's the end for Carnap. <clears throat> So all these claims of metaphysics, then if they're meaningless, then what are they really doing? Why use these words? Why do what they're doing? Here's why. It does have a content. They serve for the expression of the general attitude of a person towards life. The metaphysician believes he travels in territory in which truth and falsehood are at stake, but in reality, he has not asserted anything, but only expressed something like an artist. Metaphysics is bad art. So Hegel is a bad artist. Heidegger, a bad artist. And I've told you before, Heidegger was very drawn to poetry. Poetry is art. Um, there's also a famous painting, and I've, um, I can picture it, but I can't remember what it's called or who did it. That's pretty awful. But it's got these two like muddy boots um, that have just like traversed some mountain range or something along those lines that Heidegger was fond of. Heidegger loves art. Hegel loves art. Mm. It bleeds over into their philosophy, into their metaphysics. They're bad artists. He says as much. Very last paragraph, page 126. Perhaps music is the purest means of expression of the basic attitude, because it is entirely free from any reference to objects. The harmonious feeling or attitude which the metaphysician tries to express in a moralistic system is more clearly expressed than the music of Mozart. And when a metaphysician gives verbal expression to his dualistic, heroic attitude toward life in a dualistic system, is it not perhaps because he lacks the ability of a Beethoven to express this attitude in an adequate medium? Hegel and Heidegger can't play music, they can't paint, they can't write poems, so instead they write philosophy and try to convince us that their metaphysical claims have something to do with truth and falsehood when really it's just bad art. Mm. And so if that's the case, if Carnap is right, then I have wasted all of our times for the past I don't know how many weeks since we turned towards metaphysics, which is part of epistemology, at least the way that I was presenting it up until this point. We would have been better off listening to some John Coltrane records. A Love Supreme. Listen to that album and you know what Coltrane's general attitude toward life is. If you read Heidegger, you know what his general attitude toward life is. That's what he's doing is he's expressing himself. He's not making any philosophical claims. Sartre, Camus, all of these folks are all expressing their general attitude toward life, not really doing philosophy. Metaphysics is meaningless, so metaphysics isn't really philosophy either. Finally, Carnap thinks we can get on with real philosophy, that we can help out mathematics and we can help out science instead of wasting our time trying to be bad artists. Hmm. So then that lays the groundwork for the next at least 60 years, maybe even 70 years of philosophy. And so that's where Edmund Gettier comes in. And so the analytic school had a huge influence here in the United States, and I talked about that early on in the course. Um, there was some political stuff going on because of Marx and the Red Scare and all of that stuff, and some of it's financial too. Way more money in the National Endowment for Science than there is the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, right? Science, people can see stuff being done, right? Who do we call when stuff goes wrong, like this COVID-19 thing? Well, I don't know, how about some researchers? some medical professionals, some nurses, right? People in the sciences, they can get stuff done and help us. We don't call the artist. Hey, artist, can you, can you paint me a painting? That'll really help me feel good, right? We don't go to Frederick the Mouse. Hey, um, can you recite a poem for me to help me get through the day? Nah, no. Nah. I need to get through the day first, which means I need to live, which means I need science. Some have claimed science is what keeps us alive. And the humanities then is why it matters that we're alive. So Edmund Gettier then, and this, this is the entirety of the piece. This is not an excerpt, the Gettier. This is, uh, let's see, page 60 something I think it is. Da -da 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 -da. Here it is, page 60 to 63. This is the entirety of the article, this is it. 
And this is the article that he wrote and got published, which was the last thing he needed to do to be tenured at Harvard. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the video here and then pick up with Gettier in the next part.